density from the five sense uh, prison that this is the very same period when this control system is trying to impose the, 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 the more and more extreme versions of the Orwellian global state more and more control more and more um, uh, stuff in food and drink that destabilizes the, the body uh, electrochemically the, the microchipping um, agenda where they want to microchip every child at birth uh, eventually that's what they want necessarily they're going to get um, is uh, about on one level yes electronic tagging seeing where everyone is at any time but the real reason for that is to externally manipulate the receiver transmitter system if you like the body the crystalline uh, body computer as I call it through which our consciousness uh, um, experiences this um, reality we call visible light this tiny frequency range we call visible light and the idea is to manipulate um, the body's receiver transmission system so that we do not start to um, expand our ability to access these these higher vibrations I call the truth vibrations and we stay in these low density um, states of fear and and, and um, frustration and all these low vibrational states that that hold us in servitude see society is structured to stimulate maximum fear maximum stress maximum frustration maximum anger and hatred and all these things because these states are low vibrational states of being and and if you're in a low vibrational state of being just as radio a is not going to sync with radio b because they're on different wavelengths so a density um, is not going to sync with um, high levels of vibration where, where real understanding, awareness, knowledge and love in its true sense um, express themselves. So the, 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 I, I see uh, this now massive and round of applause, good on, good, good thing, this massive um, research arena to expose the conspiracy which has built up over the last few years. But to really understand what is happening in terms of the banking scams and the manipulated wars and the Orwellian surveillance agenda we've really got to understand the nature of reality itself because the the bottom line of it all is to hold us in a low vibrational state so that we do not access the true magnitude the lion the lion the higher levels of infinite consciousness that we really are we don't access them while in the physical body what we call physical anyway and therefore we are at completely at the mercy of the five senses and of course when you are getting everything through the five senses to get a, a try to get a grip or a grasp on who you are and where you are and what's going on you're gonna look into the five sense reality to get that information so where do we look we look to the education system we look to the media we look to uh, our peers and, and, and what have you and and if you can if you can disconnect uh, what you call incarnate consciousness from high le higher levels of itself beyond this reality and and then program the five sense level of being uh, with a fake sense of self a fake sense of the world a fake sense of reality by controlling the sources of information that we receive at that level then what you're doing is you're isolating people from their true self and then programming the fake self and that's why people uh, live their entire lives um, uh, like an actor you know all the world's a stage and we are the players we're acting a part it's not who we are you know it's like being on a bus sitting at the back and someone else has got their hands on the wheel in terms of the direction it's going and, and, and all the rest of it and so uh, getting out of what I call mind which is this this mind body level of um, perception and into what I call consciousness that which is the eternal self is is the revolution it is the transformation because once you move your point of observation from five sense reality alone um, to, to higher levels of consciousness then you see this world in a completely different way because you're looking at it from a completely different uh, standpoint point of observation 
in uh, in in which case um, our lives transform and our perception of self and the world transforms and this is what the truth vibrations are doing they're teasing open that mind by breaking down the density that we've uh, we've lived with all this time and you know uh, first of all uh, i want to get back to some of your earlier comments and kind of comment through as we go along here um you know you talk about your book being controversial and, and in all truth and honesty, uh, in my perspective, um, this particular book, um, as you're talking about it, is, is probably one of the most controversial. But, David, that is your, your kind of your mm, mission, I guess, is to be controversial. Because in that controversy, it opens people up, even though some people may get angry or they may poo-poo it or whatever their reaction is to it, it still has planted a seed for somewhere along the line that perhaps maybe there's something to what you've been saying all these years so that's what you call the truth vibration and I have seen such a tremendous amount I don't know you you know you see so many people all the time you're you're just an extremely uh, busy man and you interact with an awful lot of people but I'm sure in your own circle of uh, acquaintances and friends and, and family that you yourself have probably witnessed uh, these truth vibrations, is, and that's an absolutely fantastic term, um, w- at work, at play, if you will, and watch people literally from one day to the next that seems like they're getting it. They're getting it. Well, this is an interesting point because um, over the last... Um 20 years um, I've seen this transformation happen when I started out two decades ago uh, people just laughed at me there was no real sign that there was any transformation coming but uh, all all these years later my goodness me and and what's interesting Rebecca to me is that I'm seeing people moving uh, if you like distances in terms of perception Yes. massive distances very very quickly and you can do this um, once the veil lifts then you can move very fast because there's like a there's like a line there's like a Rubicon and when you cross it and that that line is uh, a certain level of perception of what reality is suddenly things fall into place so fast because you're no longer looking from a fake false perspective to try to get a fix on the world you're looking from a perspective of seeing the world as it really is and then all these mysteries and questions and stuff they start to fall they're not mysteries anymore so many mysteries are only mysteries because we've been looking at them from the from the wrong uh, point of what is reality Correct. this is why it's why science has all these cul-de-sacs all over in its various disciplines where it can't go any further if the paradigm that it has been saying is how life is and how the world is and the universe is is correct right. okay you can't you've got to rethink or re know um, the the way that reality works and then these cul-de-sacs which, which, which are cul-de-sacs because there are major questions eventually that simply can't be answered on the basis of this is how reality is then those those questions just answer themselves it's so obvious and I know that there are uh, more and more mainstream scientists who are looking at my books and this one takes that whole side massive step forward wow, and are cool. saying well hold on a second um, you know, maybe this does make sense because if what this fellow's saying is true, then we can answer this mystery, we can answer that mystery, and answer that mystery because they're not mysteries. You know, uh, I mean, if you are if you are looking for someone, and you look everywhere except where they are because you refuse to go where they are, then you're going to come back and say, "Oh no, can't be found. There's no sign of them. They, they they've gone missing. They've disappeared." But they're not disappeared. They're actually where you are refusing to go. And this is, this, is, this is where mainstream science is. It refuses to go where the answers lie. Why? Because uh, science is not there to answer mysteries. It is to keep them as mysteries. This is why these bloodline families that I've been uh, exposing all these years, they have made sure that they control the funding and the administration of science. Sure. And and if you don't sing from the song sheet as a scientist, then your funding stops. You, you find yourself 
um, losing credibility among your peers because uh, you're getting ridiculed and marginalized for saying these crazy things. Uh, and and therefore uh, science mainstream science as a structure as an institution is there to stop the answers coming out and and I know mainstream scientists who are, you know could scream with frustration because they're, they're they think well I'm between the devil and the deep blue sea here if I pursue where I I sure the answers lie I lose my funding and all that stuff and if I don't I'll never find the answers but I'll get me funding and and what I say to those people is look you know when you're on your deathbed and you're about to leave this reality, you know, what, will, will you feel good about yourself because you per pursued the truth uh, despite the consequences? And it's amazing if you pursue the truth and you get lots of challenges, it's amazing how you find ways around it, around them. Um, or are you going to, what are you going to feel about yourself if you're on that same deathbed thinking, well, I didn't actually impact on the world at all. I just got a bloody good living for a few years by by acquiescing my my truth to this um, uh, establishment structure that has been created totally to stop truth coming out. Sure. Sure. And you know, and you talk about people's perspective being you know widened more. And and it's so very true. I look at this world, David, um, from a whole different perspective than I, you, you know. It's I'm actually amazed. I sit back and I look at myself as when I was, you know, a young girl, and how I viewed the world in those days. And when you think about how your future is going to look to you, you, you just can't fathom. You can't understand until you get to the point where everything shifts around you. And as I'm looking at this world the way that it's constructed, there isn't anything, not one single thing in a day-to-day -day basis that we as human beings, on the mo for the most part, experience that isn't very well constructed, laid out, planned out, and in total control of the actions and our day-to-day -day life of the human being. It's been just absolutely fascinating as I, I look at this and I go there isn't one single space that does not that this this construct I call it the construct the, yeah, the yeah. matrix the the control mechanisms have not integrated themselves so completely so wholly into the human experience it's not even it's, it's just amazing I mean, even from from how do we eat? When do we eat? Um, that you have to you have to go here to do that. And you know this this whole thing with the whole money situation, where um, every day more and more of the working people, if you will, their money is being taken away from them from new uh, you know uh, new laws and and new taxes. And you know we have to have funding for this and funding for that and funding 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 for everything, right? Um, and it is it has gotten to be such a in a vicious cycle, and they're also you you spoke about that earlier about how all of this is happening, and it's 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 like they're stepping up their game to try to get more and more and more of it, and I just see it as an extreme implosion upcoming. I really do with this this whole construct thing. It it, it isn't is it an implosion? But like um, I I was saying, the book is controversial and um, one area where it's going to be extremely controversial is uh, how I explain why what you quite rightly um, described is a happening and be um, possible and it's interesting like, you know I've got this theme of the last 20 years be at the moment be because it is you know so close to the, 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 the two decades but um, I have realized in the writing of this book how all the different things that have happened to me uh, in the last uh, two decades have all dovetailed and have all made a contribution to what, what I'm, I'm, I'm writing in this book. And th these themes have been that we live in a virtual reality universe that has been hacked into um, by a manipulative controlling force and it's exactly the same principle of the, as the fact that 
you can go on the internet in most parts of the world and you can go um, anywhere on that internet that you choose to go at least you can at the moment um, but if you go to China you can't the Chinese computer system has been firewalled off so that Chinese people can only access part uh, 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 of that uh, collective reality we call the internet and not uh, vast uh, swathes of it now um, I have realized over the years through various connected ways that that is the situation that we face in this reality um, the, how, how I've explained it in the book is this the suns within this universe interact with the black holes uh, there, I think some German scientists have established and after a long um, project that uh, there's a black hole at the center of this galaxy it absolutely fits mm -hmm. because out of the black holes comes the vibration um, and that vibration stimulates photon release from these packets of energy which is the basis of light it's photon release from the suns in, the, in our case of course our sun and this vibrational uh, resonance goes through a cycle and this vibrational resonance as it changes and moves um, it elicits different forms of information from the suns on the sun in our case and so what it, this, as this vibration changes in this cycle which eventually comes round and back to the start um, it, it, it is changing the reality that people are experiencing um, as a result and this is where the whole ancient principle in so many ancient cultures if not all of them of secular time comes in like the yugas in 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 the Indian uh, India area of the world the Hindu area etc um, the what the Mayans talked about with with the cycles of time the cycles and the ages these are created by the vibrational uh, changes uh, coming out of the black holes and and as they as this cycle moves and it's vast and we come in and experience a bit of it so we think we're going from past through present to future but we're actually in what I call the time loop this is what the name of my books a few years ago was called tales from the time loop and now I'm beginning to see more and more about how it works and so as the vibration changes we move into what people call another age another era another epoch and so there's one uh, age which is known uh, in many cultures as the golden age when everything's kind of you know wonderful and all the rest of it and then there are other ages which are much more challenging and these these are, are, are in the in the in the cosmic game uh, ways of experiencing different things because when we're choosing to experience them from a level of consciousness disembodied consciousness we're seeing that experience in a completely different way to when we're actually experiencing it here Sure. Uh, and we are now at the point where we are moving into a new era, a new epoch in this cycle. And that's why the vibration is changing. And suddenly uh, the reality is changing. The sense of reality is changing. And what we're uh, seeing is a change in the information, the base uh, construct information of this reality coming from the Sun and, and, and so we're starting to decode different information now this is a, an area where um, it's going to be really controversial when the book comes out I am saying this staggering as it may seem I'm saying that that process that I've just described has been hacked into from the moon I'm saying the moon is not a heavenly body as we think it is. Um, in fact, there were two Russian scientists in the 70s who, who produced a whole paper saying exactly the same and explaining why. Very, very compelling. And that the moon actually is where this whole uh, hack is being um, manipulated from. And it's created something that I call in the book the moon matrix. It is, a, uh, it is broadcasting an alternative reality which is hacking into that um, information from the sun.
and it is changing it. It can't replace it because that's the base reality uh, or construct information of this reality. What it can do is change it so that it affects our reality. And then, as I said earlier, all these different things and themes that have come into my work over the last 20 years, they've all kind of come together in this book because another theme, and this is not just in my book but many, many others, and a theme in ancient cultures, accounts and legends all over the world, is how a genetic intervention, a genetic manipulation by the gods, usually the serpent gods. And what I'm saying in this book is that that genetic manipulation was to um, tune the human body computer into the moon matrix. But because the moon matrix is broadcasting on a frequency that is resonates to low vibrational emotion, like all the things we've just talked about, fear, guilt, frustration, anger, hatred, um, uh, insecurity, fear of not surviving, the, the human society has to be structured to keep people in that state because uh, while they are, they are going to be tuned into this moon matrix and it's going to be the, the, the hive mind of humanity. And that's what they've done. They've connected us in to their hive mind via this moon matrix. And this hive mind, therefore, is feeding people who are, who, who are in the density that, that, that allows a powerful connection a sense of reality, a collective sense of reality, which means that people basically become clones of each other, like computers. You, you type in the data, i.e. the situation, press enter, and you get a reaction uh, from people in this country or that country or that country or this culture or that culture, which is virtually exactly the same, uh, given the same circumstances, the same reaction, the same emotional reactions. It's because we're connected to a hive mind. And you know, when I was writing this book, I. I came across um, some quotes from uh, the books of Carlos Castaneda, which were in the kind of 60s period, in which he's quoting this uh, Central American shaman source uh, called um, Don Juan Matos. And when I read some of these quotes, uh, I, I, I uh, kind of took a deep breath because I'd not seen them before. And, and this is one of them from, from Don Juan. We have a predator that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. Indeed, we are held prisoner. They took us over because we are food to them, and they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in coops, the predators rear us in human coops human arrows. Therefore, their food is always available to them. Think for a moment and tell me how you would explain the contradiction between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of belief, or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of belief, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetedness, greed, and cowardice. It is the predator who makes us complacent, routinary, and egomanical. In order to keep us obedient, meek, and weak, the predators engage themselves in a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist. A horrendous maneuver from the point of view of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any moment now. And he just goes on to say, I know that even now you never have suffered hunger, but you have food anxiety, which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that at any moment now its maneuver is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Through the mind, which after all is their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them and they ensure in this manner a degree of security to act as a buffer against their fear. Sorcerers of ancient Mexico reason that man must have been a complete being at one point, with stupendous insights, feats of awareness that are mythological legends nowadays, and then everything seems to disappear, and we have a sedated man. 
What I'm saying is that we have against us not a simple predator. It is a very smart and organized uh, predator, paraphrasing. It follows a methodical system to render us useless. Man, the magical being that he is destined to be, is no longer magical. He's an average piece of meat. There are no more dreams for man but the dreams of an animal who is being raised to be a piece of meat, trite, conventional, imbecilic. And as I've um, put this book together over the last 10 months, although it was a chunk when I was traveling and talking, but um, it makes what I've just read makes total uh, synchronistic sense with what I've come across. And that uh, gave us their mind stuff is the moon matrix. And as we become more and more conscious, as opposed to stuck in mind, the five sense body mind, we, we disconnect vibrationally from the moon matrix. And suddenly we see things that the moon matrix was suppressing us from seeing up to that point. And, you know, I won't go into it all now. It's all in the book in detail. But it's interesting, you know, that when you're born into this world, you kind of accept it for what it is. Well, this is the world. This is how it is. This is why, you know, we are the last generations that uh, are, are the way things are at the moment who are going to have the ability to see how things were in terms of life and surveillance and control um, compared with what they're becoming. Because the, the young people being born into the world of surveillance and control and microchips and cameras, etc., to them, this is how the world is. This is why they're putting all this stuff into schools now, because they're getting the young generation used to constant surveillance and control. And it's the same with the moon. You look at the moon, yes, there's the moon, it's in the sky, and is it a full moon, or is it a new moon, or whatever? But you, you accept it. But when you ask questions about it, suddenly you go, whoa, I never knew that. For instance, um, there are so many anomalies about the moon, they have no idea how, how it was created. They have a theory, which is a nonsense theory, and they've had, to, <laughs> they've had to keep changing it to try to avoid the nonsense, and they just keep in the nonsense. But there is no way in the world, Rebecca, in the normal course of physics and uh, magnetic fields and all that stuff, that the Earth should have a satellite that enormous. It's bigger than Pluto. I was reading, um, in fact, some scientists don't talk about an Earth-Moon system. They talk about a, pla a, a dual planetary system. And when um, uh, you, you see what, 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 what scientists have said uh, about how it should be in the normal course of events, if the Earth had a satellite at all, and that's far from uh, certain, given its, uh, the power of its magnetic field and the size of it and every rest of it, it would be a very, very small satellite. One estimated it would be about 30 miles around. The moon is in excess of 2,000 miles around. And then you, you, um, you say, well, okay, where did it come from? And the scientific theory, which is then printed as fact, because when you see so much scientific fact, you say, okay, well, where does it come from? And it's a theory. First of all, they say a planet about the size of Mars crashed into the Earth eons ago. A big piece of the Earth broke off and became the uh, moon. Well, that's, that's, that's very difficult to, 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 to follow on when the moon is very unlike the Earth in terms of its content. Uh, at mineral content, etc., etc., and uh, b rocks on the moon have been found to be well, fantastically in excess of any, any uh, the age of any rocks found on the Earth. And when this Mars-sized planet hitting the Earth uh, became the moon, didn't pan out and work out in terms of the physics. Uh, they called it the the Big Whack theory. They came up with a double Big Whack theory to try to explain away the anomalies, and that was that the Mars-sized planet sized planet hit the Earth and then came back and hit it again. You know, I've given you, on a, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the right, and I'm going to give you the left. I mean, all that stuff. And, and um, then you, um, you find that there are metals on the, on, the, on the moon that are not found naturally, that, um, as one scientist said, there are so many anomalies with regard to the moon that it can't be answered, that the only thing you can say about the moon, he said, is it must be observational error. It can't be there. Um, and, and, and I've detailed all these in the book, all these anomalies and all these things. And, and then you look at the extraordinary synchronicity in size, ratio, mathematics, etc., between the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. 
doesn't work with any of the other uh, planets of the solar system, it works with those three bodies. And crucial to making that trinity, if you like, work, is the position, size, etc. of the moon. It's no accident that, you know, the, 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 at the time um, that the moon crosses the sun in an eclipse, it's virtually the same size when viewed from Earth um, as, as, as the sun appears to be when viewed from Earth. Uh, and all the other incredible synchronicities between the, the, the positions of the sun and the moon in relation to the earth at different times of the year. This is all part of the, the, the moon, moon matrix, creating the moon matrix. And the other thing, of course, that the moon impacts on massively, um, even without any transmissions, as I'm talking about, is, is the hormonal um, balance and state of the body. And it, it fundamentally affects what we call the third eye because it massively affects the moon um, the pineal gland which is where we we, we go beyond um, five cents sight into other levels of reality so uh, like I say the, the book 700 pages nearly so there's 355,000 words of stuff in there and there's a lot to to say before this stuff makes even more sense because of the connections and the dots but you know when you look at the moon pe people will immediately say the moon's not real it's probably a hollowed out planetoid and this is another interesting area Rebecca because that's what these um, Russian scientists said in the 70s it's a hollowed out planetoid it's been uh, if you like converted by an intelligence that is vastly stunningly in um, uh, uh, in uh, excess of, of what humans can do now and this is an important point if you look at what is possible only on the basis of what we perceive to be possible in human society and that's only human society we know about by the way then right. you're, you're never going to understand what's actually going on because the, we're dealing with um, non-human uh, races that are vastly ahead technologically of where we're at but when you go um, through the, 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 the science of the moon, as, as one um, scientist said, the moon is inside out because what's on the surface really should be inside. Well, that, that, what's what they've said? It's been hollowed out. And then I called uh, Credo Mutwa after I put all this together, my great friend, the Zulu shaman and official historian of the Zulu nation. And I didn't say to him, hey, Credo, I've come up with all this, this stuff. What do you think? I said, quite simply, can you tell me any Zulu legends, and I found the Zulu legends and accounts to be incredibly accurate over the years, um, wonderfully symbolic of, of, of what you might call scientific truths. Um, and I said, can you tell me any Zulu legends about the moon? And he said, yes. He said, Zulus uh, believe that um, the moon comes from a long way away. Um, it comes from basically from the, the region of the Orion uh, constellation. And that two um, serpent gods, he gives them a name um, uh, in, in Zulu uh, law, um, created it by hollowing out the moon to create this interstellar uh, craft, if you like. And he said, that's why we symbolize the moon, and incidentally, so many other ancient uh, cultures do, as an egg, because they symbolized it as the yolk of the egg being taken out. And then he said it was rolled across the sky um, to, to, to the earth. And when it arrived, it caused massive devastation on the earth. And when you then look at the ancient legends about ca catastrophic geological and biological events, which every ancient culture uh, talks about, and one of the common themes is that the earth turned over. Well, the earth is at the angle it is because of its effect an interaction with the moon. This, we have seasons because of the Earth's angle to the sun, and we have the angle to the sun because of the moon. So the seasons were created by the moon, or are created by the moon. Um, and it affects the speed of the Earth's spin. It fundamentally affects um, uh, life on Earth, the moon. And uh, when you put the Zulu legends together, with the science as I have in the book in, in great detail that they complement each other in a stunning way and what is happening now is that as this vibrational change from the the Sun as a result of the vibrational change from the black hole is is now starting to impact itself on human uh, perception they are battening down the hatches to try to keep 
the moon matrix in control of human perception. So uh, this is uh, one of the uh, key um, reasons, if not the key reason, for the HARP uh, technology in Alaska, and they've got other uh, uh, parts of it now in different parts of the world. It's a sub-reality. They're creating a sub-reality to underpin the moon matrix so that we do not go with this changing um, energetic information, uh, um, energetic uh, communication that is changing coming from the sun. It's to hold humanity in servitude in the five senses and this is where the microchips come in because they want to destabilize the body uh, externally and hold us in the moon matrix um, uh, vibrational field this is why they're feeding us um, food and drink additives that are uh, destabilizing and imbalancing the body electrochemically it's again to stop us um, uh, going and connecting with these this vibrational change and this is why they want surveillance and control of people and the fear of uh, uh, all these different things that are going on wars and and, and, and climate change and, and 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 fear of even now fear of, of law enforcement fear of all this stuff it's to um, hold us in this emotional therefore vibrational state that holds us in the moon matrix and those who, who are able to go beyond that, they are looking at the world in a completely different way, which literally, those who haven't gone beyond it simply can't compute. They look at you and they think, you're, you're crazy, that's impossible. No, it, it, it's your sense of possibility is limited because of what you're tuned to. Tune out of it, and anyone can do it, and suddenly everything will start to fall into place very fast. It's like Sleeping Beauty waking up. And this is why, we, as we talked about earlier, Rebecca, you've got uh, people waking up now, breaking out of this moon matrix, I would say, who suddenly go, wow, why didn't I see this before? It's so obvious because you, you were tuned to something else before. That's why. Right, you're still in the, the lower density uh, energetic um, space. Yeah. And you know, and that, and... and you know, another thing is is that as you look at the moon, David, um, throughout all of our lives, you know, the moon is in effect control of the emotions. Exactly. Um, during the full moon, you notice that people, it seems like literally people just kind of like drool and stuff. They just, they lose their brain. It's like the werewolf coming out or something. And then, you know, when the, the moon goes into the new moon phase, so to speak, then people have a tendency to calm down a little bit but you know when you start looking at that and you know this whole premise of that you start looking at that and you're going well isn't that interesting because that very nature of of the up and down emotions also would keep the human being off guard off centered not being able to um, focus because one day you feel like you know you need to go out and 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 you know beat people up and then you know a couple weeks later you just want to sit and you know do the own thing or whatever I mean it, it is very carefully constructed and that's that's what my guidance has been talking to me is about the infiltration of every single thing has just been very carefully constructed I mean the minds that uh, put this um, matrix this moon matrix or or whatever it is together i mean oh my goodness david this is one heck of a program this is how they do it wow this is how they yeah. do it and 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 one of the key ways um that they connect us to the uh, hive mind and the moon matrix um is through the reptilian brain i you know, i've said in the book you know um we have this reptilian brain what scientists call the r complex which is our so-called survival mechanism it's where we get fight or, f or, or, or flight or from flight. it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it sees everything in terms of will I survive or won't I survive that's not just physically that's will I survive financially will my partnership survive will I keep my job it's all about or anything to do with survival is the reptilian brain reacting and and so again what are we looking at we're looking at a society that is based on keeping people systematically in a state of fearing not surviving whether it's financially or, or in any other way and once you are in this mental state this emotional state of fear of not surviving you are filtering reality through the 
uh, reptilian brain, uh, uh, the one of the oldest parts of the brain. So they say, I say that reptilian brain did not come from uh, uh, our reptilian past, n not in, in its current state anyway. It was actually part of the genetic manipulation because if you um, look at, get beyond the flesh and blood, what the human body is, is... Um, is a, a, a vibrational construct and you, sure. you can liken the um, reptilian brain to like a microchip and it's a microchip that is connecting us to the moon matrix and for that to be done powerfully once again we have to be held and manipulated into those emotional mental states that that are processed by the reptilian brain because in that uh, processing we're connecting to the moon matrix the reptilian I would say hive mind uh, and so it, again once you disconnect from fear and you disconnect from these um, senses of fearing not surviving you are disconnecting from a domination of your reality and perception of the reptilian part of the human brain and in doing so you're again disconnecting from the moon matrix and, uh, you know, everything, if you look at it, is about holding us in that reptilian brain. They're always giving us reasons to fear not surviving in some form. All right, David, hang on with that thought. We're going to go ahead now, folks, and take a long break. We'll see you back here at the top of the hour. Don't go away. There's more coming. Some of this in years past, and, and I always thought that the moon was, was um, I don't know, um, there was something strange about it. Yeah, it yeah. was just too weird. It doesn't it doesn't move, it doesn't go anywhere, it just sits there. So and and I thought, okay, so the moon is in charge of our emotions. And again then I started looking at the waves of energy that comes off the moon and how it influxes it you know, it has this uh, it, you know, it's like an in and out, it's almost like it breathes or something, this this emotional impact and then it draws it away. Emotional impact and draws it away. It's like a breathing mechanism, so to speak, on an energetic level and I thought, Well, that surely just can't be good for somebody that's wanting to um, you know, remain, you know, at peace and calm within if you've always got this influx and then it goes away and an influx and it goes away. So I'm looking at this and at what would happen if that was no longer here. Well, I what would happen if it was taken out of out of our um, uh, uh, orbit? Well, I think um, it would have uh, certainly initially uh, massive and catastrophic um, sure. uh, impacts on the Earth because once once it's come in and it has changed the um, the nature of the Earth spin and the nature of the Earth angle, then of course. You, you have you have catastrophic implications when it happens, and you'd have catastrophic implications when it when it left. And uh, you know, I am understanding more and more as I wake up more and more because it's it's a process. You don't just wake up; it's a process. Sure. And and um, that there is there is a, a, another force at work here uh, 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 that is impacting on this, and and. You know, I was told it, it can't all be changed immediately because the whole thing right. would, would collapse. But what I'm sure is going to happen is that that force, which is in control of the moon, is going to be relieved of that control. Um, but, but um, you know, there's so much more to know because, again, we're, we're just thinking here um, on the five sense level. If you look at the moon, that is just a holographic decoded uh, uh, expression of a waveform construct um, and and so many th things if, if indeed everything that we we think of the physical reality is actually changed at the waveform level what I call the metaphysical universe which is the information construct from which we decode this uh, out out of that we decode this holographic reality that appears physical and ho and solid but isn't and this is uh, why you can again solve the mystery of why quantum physicists can say well nothing's solid it's just vibrating energy and and yet everything seems to be solid so how can something like an atom which has no solidity create a solid world it can only do it because <clears throat> it's not a solid world it's a decoded world that appears to be solid and and so all change takes place um, on the vibrational level and in terms of the <clears throat> human mind that's what we call the subconscious level the, the, that that's that's it's in, it's in the sub, uh, subconscious levels 
of mind that we connect with the metaphysical universe the information construct and uh, that's the that's the that's the movie real if you like that's where the movie's made and and what we call the physical solid world is the screen on which it's played out holographically the re right. the change takes place at a, at a vibrational level and that's where the truth vibrations are impacting we are seeing them play out um, holographically in people in, our, in, in the so-called physical world changing their perceptions and, and what have you but actually it's all going on in, 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 in the waveform fabric of this reality it's the same with what's happening in the moon um, uh, it's, it's happening there and, and uh, like I say in the book I go into this in, in enormous detail because you, you know there is enormous detail to, to, to put together now um, about, about all this and um, there are great questions I have about you know what happens to the moon as we go along but um, certainly um, it's uh, fundamental to uh, human life and uh, human particularly emotional perception well so and here's a question and you 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 may or may not have um, put this in the book you may not have looked at this but what was the what do you think was the purpose behind that big thing that Obama did, which was to, you know, to bomb the moon? What do you think that was about? Well, the, that well, the, 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 there's, um, well, first of all, I, 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 we found water on the moon and, and, and this and that, the moon. It, oh, whatever. It, it, it's, it, it's, 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 it's on one level, I mean, that's not the only level, but on one level, it's underpinning the fact that it's some kind of natural phenomenon when it isn't. Um, mm -hmm. But if you notice, uh, we were supposed to... Um, they're supposed to go back to the moon, and Obama's just cancelled that. Sure. And and there's this massive gap between when uh, we went to the moon, and uh, I would say we went to the moon in craft that are m were much more advanced than the ones we saw on the telly. Uh, yeah. But but there's been this big gap that when we haven't, and I was sent a a, a, a film um, by someone about two days ago called Moon Rising, which I hadn't actually seen, and it's a documentary. I think came about came out in the last two or three years um, in which uh, they're looking at the way NASA photographs were smudged and um, airbrushed if you like to take out um, non-natural phenomena from the surface of the moon and uh, there have been many many stories over the years about um, things like obelisks and other things that have been seen mm -hmm. on the surface of the moon uh, and and they get airbrushed out, and sometimes blatantly they blatantly just put a a, a, a like a, a square over them, so you can't see them. And you can see the square; it's obviously covering something, but obviously you don't know what. Um, and they're not doing that by accident. I mean, when people have come out um, in some of these um, uh, places, like at the uh, National Press Club, I think it was in 2001 when they had the disclosure project and people who knew things ab about the, the moon and, and other things, extraterrestrial activity, who'd worked within NASA and other companies and that relate to it, came out and told their story. And uh, a number of those um, related to the moon, one in particular who I've quoted in the book, um, a man who's uh, worked in the photographic uh, area and uh, was shown pictures of what he was told was a, a, a base on the dark side of the moon, the part of the moon we never see. And um, uh, it's, of course, it was never released um, to the public. And I would say that um, it's not the surface of the moon particularly, though of course there'll be interesting things on the surface of the moon because there will be um, activity there of a non-natural um, nature. But uh, the real thing is inside the moon. That's where it is. And, you know, so often uh, you see in... Hollywood movies and, and what have you, you see the truth being told symbolically um, by people who um, are insiders. And I would say that is the case with Star Wars. Um, I think, well, I've been saying in my books for years that George Lucas is an insider who has access to this knowledge and he's played out in the Star Wars um, movie uh, series uh, a uh, story that in theme is accurate and it's not doesn't happen in a, in a galaxy far far away it happens in this one um, and, and, and interestingly uh, one of the phenomena is the Death Star um, which is uh, looks like the moon which is a construct um, and which is put 
into um, orbit. It's like a spacecraft and, and is able to control worlds as a result and, and has a, a devastating weapon capability as well with, with, with lasers and what have you. And um, inside this Death Star are a, a series of um, compartments that, that, that are, are in effect a, um, a orbiting city or orbiting world um, inside. And, and again, when you look at the evidence, I detail it in the book, um, when the moon has been hit by uh, you know, powerful collisions with various uh, natural or non-natural objects, um, uh, it's rung like a bell, to quote people at right. sir. Um And, and, and uh, it's, uh, th- it's had reverberations going um, out through it from these impacts, but they don't come back. You know, because b- basically, uh, great chunks of the moon is, is actually hollow. This is where th- this whole uh, colony is. And it's been traversing the, uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, this part of the universe, but, but other the gr- parts of the universe for a long, long time. That's why um, they've found uh, stuff on the surface of the moon that's much older than anything found on Earth. Uh, this is why they've found... Uh, moon rocks of a certain estimated age uh, standing in moon dust that is much older because as it's uh, uh, traveled around the universe it's picked up different phenomena from different parts that uh, uh, that it's gone through and interestingly this seems to be a modus operandi it seems to be um, the the way that this uh, race uh, serpent race, uh, this, this aspect of it, takes over worlds in, in the way that we've been talking about. In fact, I, uh, I, I pointed out in the book um, that uh, Phobos, the moon, uh, one of the moons uh, orbiting Mars, uh, has been suggested over the years by scientists, if you going back to the 60s and so, so forth, that actually it too is a construct. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was sent something yesterday, I haven't fully read through it yet, from the Richard Hoagland website, where, mm-hmm. which is um, an, an article about the fact that that Mars moon is in fact a construct and he's not an, an, a natural uh, uh, body. What I'm saying is that our moon, our big moon, is, uh, is the, exactly the same. It's just a much bigger version of it. Uh, and, you know, how could anyone build that or, or uh, how could anyone hollow that out? And call because you're dealing with technological knowledge that is thousands and thousands of years ahead of where we are. Um, and, and so we have to open our minds to that. Otherwise, we're going to be saying all the time, it's not possible, it's not possible, it's not possible. No, it's not possible for us to do it. It is possible for others to do it who, who have a greater understanding of what reality is and therefore how you can use that knowledge to create things that we can't. Well, and, and that being said, you know, I've been uh, uh, chatting with some people here too, David, uh, that have been uh, talking about some different types of technology that's still here on this earth and we don't even know how to use it. And, you know, these different stones and, and things that are placed here. We don't even have the technology in this third dimensional, third density world, if you will, yeah. to create such monuments ourselves. And, um, or, um, structures or what have you and because it does not come it does not use the same tools it does not use the same technology and in order for us to really be able to understand it we really have to let go of what we think is possible exactly we have to exactly and uh, you know the these great uh, ancient structures that that we would struggle to build today where uh, rocks of hundreds of tons were moved long distances and put in, into perfectly uh, formed uh, walls so you couldn't get a cigarette paper between the, the, the joins. Um, they were um, created by this moon race, this serpent moon race. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's interesting that um, there's a book I read called Who Built the Moon? Uh, because how it came about was I sat at my computer one day. This has happened so many times in the last 20 years. And suddenly, I'd thought about it here and there over the years uh, about the moon. Uh, but um, it, it was just on the back burner. And I sat down in this chair I'm sitting in now about 
I don't know, nine months ago, maybe a bit more, and suddenly it hit me. The moon's not real. The moon is hollow. The moon is a construct, and that's where the Earth is being controlled from. And I'm sitting there, and I've kind of had that experience many, many times in different way so I wasn't surprised by it but I thought whoa where's that come from um, and, and and what I did is I then went on the internet and I thought well I'll just I'll just see if there's anything I was not expecting to find anything and I found a book called who built the moon which came out quite a few years ago now in which these two um, researchers were looking at the anomalies of the moon and how all the, the the mathematics between like I said earlier the moon the sun and the and the Earth are just fantastically synchronistic, uh, unbelievably synchronistic. And one of the um, things they do is connect the, the, the dimensions and synchronicity of the Moon to places like Stonehenge and to these great megalithic structures. And, and they ask in the book, um, how can this synchronicity between the, the, the Moon and these, these megalithic structures be so perfect? Why? Because the people in the Moon created those structures. Um, and, and therefore, of course, they were going to synch synchronize with them. And, and it's another controversial thing I say in the book. Well, not controversial for everybody, but controversial for, for a lot of people who are into um, ancient structures and stone circles and stuff. I say that those stone circles and pyramids, because uh, the, the reptilians, the serpent gods, are the pyramid builders. That's one of their great calling cards. They um, instigated... Um, stone circles, standing stones, other megalithic structures, pyramids, etc., as part of the suppression of the Earth's natural magnetic system, so that it again, um, one expression of it, was it lowered the vibrational field that we are living in. It's part of connecting us to the moon matrix. They do it with other ways too, like putting, um, you know, freeway interchanges on vortex points by building nuclear power stations on vortex points by doing mm -hmm. anything that will will suppress and and um, dilute the power of the earth's um, natural um, meridian energy system because it's all part of suppressing human capability and human potential so i say that they these the, at least the vast majority of these great megalithic structures and pyramids were put there as to suppress the the Earth's uh, energy field and uh, meridian line uh, system uh, as part of this uh, control. Wow, that's a, that's a whole lot of there to, to think about. Um, and, you know, we do know, we do know from some of the newer uh, revealed archaeological digs that they go in under, uh, you know, like uh, sacred sites, for an example, and they get in there and they start digging and they go down and they find two, three, four, five, six civilizations, one built on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, um, on these sacred sites or energetic sites. So we do know that's, you know, that's been going on. I mean, that's that's been revealed to us as well. So what you're saying makes total sense when they... You know, you, you have to look at that. And I look at everything from an energetic viewpoint anyway, David, when I look at yeah, it. Yeah, you have to. And I, I, yeah, and I look at it and I go, okay, so we're out in the middle of nowhere and we've built that. Why? Why did you do that? And you go in there and you start looking at the energy signatures, if you will, and you go, oh, that's very, very interesting. So you can see, I mean, for those that, that are able to sense that, to get out of the third dimensional viewpoint, if you will, if they're able to see that, they're able to go in there and sense it for themselves. And it's very, very well constructed. Like I said, my own guidance, I have a whole thing on my website talking about the constructs. And that's the word that they used to me. My guidance was the term was construct, that's, plural, that's, many of them. That's exactly the, um, that's exactly the, the word. Um, yeah, and it's it's a it's it's a construct. I mean, the the virtual reality universe as a whole is a construct um, because it's it's just a, a, a creation. It's a creation where people uh, or consciousness experiences different things. Uh, but what what I call the moon matrix is hacked into that construct and uh, mm -hmm. modified it to um, manipulate human perception, and uh, therefore we do not see. As a result of the genetic manipulation and the uh, the hive mind, we do not see uh, as much of the universe as we used to see, as humans used to see. What we now call um, dark matter and uh, you know dark energy 
it's not pitch black it's just it's just it's just an area of the universe that we can't access anymore it's just as the computers in china cannot access vast chunks of the world wide web this is why visible light which is an infinitesimal frequency range um, within the um, electromagnetic spectrum um, is so tiny we, we, we used to see far more you know they used to say uh, the gods lived among us well the gods don't live among us now as they go because they could see the frequency range on which these quote gods operated when the genetic manipulation happened it so truncated our visual frequency range our breadth of, 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 of decoding what we call human sight that suddenly those quote gods were still where they always were but we can not see them anymore and this is why you've got situations where animals like cats will react to things in so-called empty space to us but it's not empty space to them they can see things we can't see right it's that it's that interdimensional stuff it's that the the, the, the I call them strings timelines whatever i mean it's it's really a matter of of how you view that but if somebody can just sit in their space, wherever that space is, and if they really just reach out and get beyond that space, they can actually start sensing and feeling things that are right next to them. Right. It, it's amazing. It really is amazing. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, uh, you've you done uh, an absolutely huge service to humanity, and I'm sure you know that, and I'm sure your your, your trip to the psychic all them many, many years ago... Um, probably unfolded quite differently than what you first interpreted it <laughs> yeah i didn't i didn't know what was happening the, i didn't know what was happening for about a year after that and got a clue well yeah and that was probably you shifting and changing and and maybe inviting that energetic being that was all around you into your space without maybe you being totally conscious of that and so what a you know what a fascinating uh, way to look at that I just I, it's just um, this whole construct thing you know that just started with me I don't know about six months ago they started talking to me about this whole construct thing and every day I experience something new within that whole construct um, kind of scenario that they've laid out before me and it's almost difficult to put into words the depth and the level and and the enormity, um, the very fabric, if you will, of its infiltration. Yeah, and you can't, like I think I said earlier, you can't understand um, to any depth the manipulation of human society in terms of banking scams and manipulated wars and surveillance programs, etc., and uh, microchipping agendas. You can't understand that in, until you see these this bigger level of reality because that is uh, the the waveform construct playing out in holographic society and this is how they can play it out so synchronistically so uh, much uh, in the way that it dovetails and connects where this happens uh, over here this happens over there this surveillance here this war here or this, it, it dovetails um, uh, so well from their point of view because the information is encoded in the waveform level of the universe what I call the metaphysical universe and then plays out it's like it's like me um, programming this computer to do certain things and then I press enter and it plays it out on the screen same thing mm -hmm. and what what we need to do and this this is why understanding this is is vital we need to unpick this hack and when we do and we will we will do that then this control system will fall and like I say it will be like, pe like <coughs> people sleeping beauty waking up what, where have I been what's happened because suddenly that hive mind will be disconnected from the human mind and, and um, it's going to be one heck of a ride uh, in the period, the period coming up, it really is. Well, and you know, I have to say, every time you say that term, hive mind, all I can think of is Stargate Atlantis, and they talk about the race and the hive mind, and um, it just, it just, uh, just strikes me that whole hive mind mentality. Because, uh, um, and here's a question for you: you can choose to answer it or not. You, you call them the, the reptilian, but is that what you, who you think is? 
kind of uh, running the control system within the moon matrix? Oh yeah, uh, def definitely uh, the, the serpent gods. Um, I've I've um, gone into that in, in in considerable detail in the book, Good. and and what what's uh, uh, there to be found is that when you um, you look at tens of thousands of years of human existence the the common deity the the common god or gods to all of these different um, areas of the world is the serpent god the serpent gods and and then they express themselves in in in, in other ways too because um, one of the common themes is that uh, Prada Mutwa talks about this but so do many other areas of, of the um, ancient world the common theme that the serpent gods said to humans you must never uh, depict us as we really look or, or else basically simplifying it um, and so they, they, they were symbolized in other ways they were symbolized as being certainly clearly not human but that they weren't actually symbolized, although you can find literal symbolism, but uh, no, uh, more it's, it's uh, symbolism of a non-human form, but not that they look reptilian. And this was to uh, identify this non-human influence without actually overstepping the mark as they s would have seen it, that, that we depict the gods as they really look. This is why on um, Credo Mutwa's um, what's called uh, Necklace of the Mysteries, where he's got this massive, he calls it necklace, but or he doesn't call it, it's what it's been known for a long, long time. It's like a big copper uh, circle which goes onto his shoulders and, and dropping down from this uh, circle uh, of copper is, uh, are all these symbols uh, which, which Credo and the storytellers before him in the line have used to tell the story of the human race and the story of Africa. And uh, at the front is a, um, a, a human woman and hanging next to her is a entity that looks anything but human and uh, the, uh, the, the, the male non-human entity has an erect penis made of copper which used to be made of gold, Credo said, which takes us up to North Africa and Egypt and one of the prime centers of their myths which was the golden penis of Osiris well that, that, that's just another expression of it down um, in s southern Africa here and um, I said to him when I first met him so long ago now, what do those two mean? And he said, this symbolizes the um, interbreeding between the Chitahuri, the serpent gods, the children of the serpent, as that uh, uh, translates as, with humans to create this, the, the hybrid race. And this necklace of the mysteries is mentioned in accounts 500 years old. And um, uh, Credo says it's at least a thousand years old. Well, also, I've seen it, I've touched it, and, uh, you know, wow. been, been um, taken around uh, the, the symbols by, by Credo at his home. And uh, hanging from it is a hand which has the all-seeing eye on it, which has um, the Star of David, as we call it, uh, but it's not, that's not a Jewish symbol. Uh, it's it's an, an ancient esoteric symbol, which the Rothschilds took as their symbol, uh, the House of Rothschild banking empire and it became associated with Jewish people as a, a Jewish symbol. It's not. It's an esoteric symbol. Um, they found um, that uh, symbol on the, the floor of a, um, an Islamic uh, temple which was unearthed um, near Tel Aviv or in Tel Aviv. So it's, it's an ancient symbol. Uh, so that's on this hand that is 500 years old at least and Credo says 1,000 years old. Also on there is the constellation of Orion. Um, mm -hmm. on this hand and what else is, 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 is on the necklace of the mysteries a flying saucer a classic flying saucer that, we, that, we, that people call UFOs and all the rest of it and he said they are the ships that the Chittahuri came to the earth in and they came in them from the moon you know and, mm -hmm. and there, there's constant interaction between the moon uh, uh, serpent gods race and the earth because by its very nature the moon needs the earth's resources to continue to exist this is why mm -hmm. uh, when uh, Don Juan Matters was talking there about their fear of, of um, humans waking up and realizing uh, what's going on and their food source being removed humans and the earth are their food source they are, they are their resource source because they don't have them uh, themselves 
And because it's uh, uh, something that traverses the universe uh, and has been doing, going on for eons and eons and eons, and there are many moons like them, many, many moons like them, like I say, it's a modus operandi. Um, sure. It means that they are dependent upon the target planet for survival. <laughs> so that's why, they're ter- <laughs> that's why they're terrified of being found out. It's to get, it's the games up because technological aware, technologically aware as they are, and spiritually dead as they are, um, they um, they still need the Earth and humanity to survive, and, and that's why they're desperate not to be uncovered. Well, sorry guys, the day has arrived. So, oh, um, hmm. You know, I, I'm looking at that situation, David, as you even as you're talking about it, and I'm thinking to myself. Um, is it just enough for us just to become aware of their presence and and to change that? Well, once once we once we once we disconnect from the moon matrix, we are going to have um, as we move along extraordinary abilities. You know, um, one of the key ways that the moon matrix c- controls humanity is it puts us in the left brain, uh, where it puts. Um, moon matrix people in the left brain anyway and it does this to a large part by closing down vast areas of what it, what is called the corpus callosum which is the bridge between the right and left brain what should happen is information is exchanged um, between those two hemispheres so we, we are whole brain people but once um, we are locked in the left brain that sees everything in terms of a partness in terms of structure uh, and, 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 and therefore we, we live in a left brain society, we live in a left brain world. It's all about structure and apartness and language and, 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 and what have you. The right brain is our connection out into infinity, into, into the infinite awareness, infinite knowledge. And this is why you get these people um, who get damaged uh, to the left brain or the left brain's not functioning. That, that can get amazing abilities which to left brain society are miraculous and impossible but they're not there's this uh, guy Stephen Wiltshire um, in England who um, is what they call an autistic savant um, mm-hmm. and uh, he has staggered people like on one occasion uh, the BBC flew him up over London in a helicopter for half an hour just no cameras uh, that, that he had no c- camera to um, record what he was seeing and know anything he just just had to look out of the helicopter and he came back and he drew london from the air in enormous detail windows number of windows and this is a guy who because of his um his uh, autism if you like um did not have the ability to count and yet he, he got the windows right in the buildings it's extraordinary you go on the internet stephen wilshire you see what he does uh, and and what what um this fantastic ability comes from is that they get access to the true or some some of the true potential of human awareness which we've been uh, uh, disconnected from so um, we are not just gonna wake up eventually in in the way that we think we are now we're gonna start entering a period of unbelievable potential and that potential is what this reptilian race uh, in the moon cannot cope with because the very the very fact that they have a need to control everything um, means that they are in a state a low vibrational state themselves hence the moon matrix has to be in a low vibrational state because it's their hive mind and 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 um, they uh, have only been able to control humanity by putting us in a smaller box than they're in a smaller box of, of awareness than they're in and once um, and, and their box has limitations big limitations why they are in their state of perception which is fear which comes from fear of not surviving uh, and therefore people in fear of not surviving and in fear in general they want to control everything because states of flux terrify them they, if they don't know the outcome before the game starts, they can't they can't cope with that because it's it's oh no no I've got, I've got to know it can't it can't be any states of flux can't take it so they're in this box and once humans open up to their true potential even some of it we go well beyond that box you know these um these reptilians in the moon are at the moment 
some, some insiders have speculated, 10,000 years ahead of us in technological knowledge. But that, that's a misnomer, because once you cross a certain line in understanding how reality works, as opposed to how we're told it works, which is all these cul-de-sacs of limitation, um, suddenly you can, you can move 10,000 years of technological development very, very, very fast because you've crossed that line of understanding of how reality works. Right. And, uh, you know, humanity, as this vibrational change imposes itself, as we go into this next cycle of the time loop, if you like, um, a much higher cycle than the one we've been through just now in the next last epoch, um, we are going to, I mean, what we call miraculous today is going to be commonplace. Uh, and, and the control system must fall because the control system is based on keeping humans in a, uh, not just a fake identity, though that's part of it, but in a low, desperately low level of their true potential. When that true potential, or, or a great deal more of it, is activated, the control system must fall because the very basis that's holding it together will have been removed. Right. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Given me a whole bunch of things to think about in, yeah. in response to... Uh, in light of the, some of the new information, and, and it's not really new information. What it is is information that's been hidden. Yeah. I just pr I prefer to look at it from that viewpoint. It's not new information. It's just information that's been hidden. So as we we bring that hidden knowledge forward, and we bring that hidden understanding forward, and we start embracing it, and um, really start focusing on letting go of these constructs. I I get this huge expansion um, personally I get this huge expansion when I look at it um, that um, life can be so much more different so much more different in, in the way that we experience it in, in physical form for anyone that chooses to come to the earth as an experience of a lifetime yeah exactly I'm just I'm amazed I'm amazed at it I just look at this and I go wow you know, it's it's almost it's almost to the point where you can't quite get there because it's it's so beyond everything that you've learned up to this point or what you thought was was truth up to this point. That's right, and you know, it's like um, when you first hear it and it first dawns upon you. Uh, I mean, this didn't happen to me because it seemed, as I've been through the last twenty years, it just seems the most natural thing in the world to me. I don't know why, but it does. But you know, you know, in the Matrix movies, when um, when Neo is given the truth of reality, the illusory nature of reality, and he goes um, he goes kind of crazy and starts throwing up. Uh, right. That, that, that's uh, some people will experience it in an extreme way because suddenly, I've um, I've described it like this. Sometimes it's like being born into a box, and you think the box is all there is. And everyone in the box with you is telling you it's all, it's all there is. And, and everything um, just keeps going on as if the box is all there is. And then someone comes along and they lift the lid of the box off and say, have a look at this, darling. And, and crikey, that, that shock of realizing uh, how the world is a fraction of what you thought it was, uh, or your world is a fraction of what you thought it was, what the world was, can, can, can take some... Uh, integrating if you like but uh, the, the, the people coming along now are, are at least have the benefit of so many who've been through that process whereas uh, some of the pioneers were doing it um, completely um, you know making it up as they went along they had not a clue what was going on and no one to explain it to them right exactly well I'm just really, this has just been absolutely one of the most delightful conversations, David. Um, absolutely delightful in in so many different ways. Um, and before we let you go today, though, because uh, you've been kind enough to give us more time than what we originally scheduled, and I appreciate that. Um, I want you to draw attention to your uh, your newsletter and also back to your books and your website um, because you're also following um, a, a story um, that has really triggered some things uh, for many, many people in the Holly case. And um, so I subscribe to your newsletter in order to get the updates to see what's, 
you know, what's been going on and, and a different viewpoint from the world. And so if you would, if you would just share some of that information and any other thing that you would like to share with the audience today before we let you go. Well, uh, the, the, the website's been uh, completely revamped. It's a heck of a lot simpler now because um, the other one was getting kind of out of hand because it was, it was growing you know, organically, a bit like Heathrow Airport, you know, you... you, you, you <laughs> You, you you have a few huts when hardly anyone's flying, and then then you you you're suddenly flying all over the place, and suddenly you you've got to add bits, and it don't work. Have you ever been to Heathrow? It doesn't work. Um, right. Um, well, the, the, what the new terminal does, the rest of them uh, they're just like um, you know a mess. But so my website was a bit like that. So we do, we got a blank sheet of paper and redid the whole thing. Um, and uh, human race, get off their knee, off your knees. The lion sleeps no more. Is is available now and. Um, I do the newsletter once a week. Um, it looks at the world from a different perspective. It, it might take a, a subject um, that's running that week, uh, or it might come from a completely different um, angle. But it, it, it's just what comes to me. I mean, I I sit down on a Friday morning and um, I just wait for something to come to me, and then I then I follow it through. And um, it goes out every Sunday. And uh, it, it, but but the Holly case um, is, is obviously available on the site for free, like nine. 99% of the site is and um, that has been um, very very powerful because it's affected a lot of people there's a lot of people that have um, got behind it uh, because of how it's been how it's affected them and very briefly um, uh, on my site you can you can get the detail but this is a Down syndrome girl called Holly Gregg who lived up in Aberdeen in Scotland in what's called the Grampian um, area of Scotland and um, she was uh, sexually abused and raped for year after year after year after year, first of all by her father, and then um, by a, a, a string of establishment figures in Scotland, I including um, a, a judge, what they call them sher sheriffs in Scotland. Um, and Scotland, as I've been writing about for years, is a major centre of Satanism and paedophilia. It's not called the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry for no reason. And what um, the Holly Gregg case has done, her and her mother Anne, and a, a wonderful guy who's been helping them called Robert Green, um, who's, who's been arrested and bailed for the crime of telling the story of what's happened to this girl. This has kind of uh, started to lift the lid on, on many, many things. First of all, the scale of Satanism and paedophilia, and those two rings are absolutely connected, by the way. Um, in Scotland, which reverberates into the Scottish Parliament, into the whole law system of Scotland, um, into Lockerbie, uh, the Lockerbie bombing, into the, um, the, uh, the murder of those children at Dunblane uh, School um, in the 1990s, when a paedophile and procurer of, paedo of, of children for establishment paedophiles and politicians in Scotland, a man called um, Thomas Hamilton, uh, killed a, a lot of children and a teacher uh, when he went in and just with four guns and opened fire and that that's been uh, covered up because of where the the real knowledge of Thomas Hamilton and who he's connected to would have uh, uh, opened up Pandora's box for the Scottish and British establishments and uh, so all this is running on and we've got um, a general election in Britain coming up soon, uh, May the 6th I think it is, they announced it yesterday uh, and um, there are a lot of people coming together now to put pressure on the politicians when they're out canvassing for votes and at public meetings to um, answer questions about the Holly Gregg case because the police in the Grampian region would not uh, investigate her experience. The um, the head of the law uh, system in Grampian, uh, a lady called um, Ilesh uh, Angeloni, um, would not um, allow it to be investigated. She was then uh, appointed the Lord Advocate of Scotland, the top law officer in Scotland, and at that level of the whole of Scotland, she's refused to uh, pursue an investigation. The so-called Justice Secretary, the man who let the um, so-called, and it is so-called, Lockerbie Bomber free in August last year on compassionate grounds, um, a, a guy called uh, McCaskill, Kenny McCaskill, he will not have um, an investigation into it, and so it goes on. And um, it's interesting with the Lockerbie case because a number of uh, newspapers uh, here now are saying, hold on a second, 
the Lockerbie bomber who was let out um, to go back to Libya on compassionate grounds by this Kenny McCaskill guy um, uh, because he had uh, weeks uh, to live with, I think it was prostate cancer. He's still alive and flourishing now, all these months later in, in Libya. What's going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. The Libya uh, man, um, Al Magrahi, did not plant the bomb. It was a, a, a CIA, British intelligence, Mossad operation, which um, he was used to cover up by taking the blame for it. He was um, jailed um, and then he had an appeal. And the appeal was heard by a man called Lord Cullen, who was the man who oversaw the um, so-called investigation into the Dunblane killings of Thomas Hamilton. Uh, and uh, there was a massive cover-up in that so-called Dunblane inquiry to stop the truth getting out. And the first appeal of McGrahi, um, overseen by Lord Cullen, was again turned down and refused. But then his lawyers um, secured a second appeal, and that second appeal was on the basis of new evidence that had come to light to show how the CIA had paid, or, and in other cases offered to pay, vast sums of money to people to lie in court and, 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 and produce planted evidence to, um, to have um, al-Makrahi uh, jailed in the first place for a bombing he did not commit. And this uh, appeal was going to be heard in 2009. 